Hello and welcome to the Adventure and Mystery Book Club. I'm Bill Mallory, branch manager of the La Jolla Library. I'm so glad you could be with me today as we read three more chapters of Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. To, uh, today we are reading chapters 9 through 11. So, uh, just a brief recap on what has gone before. We have our uh, our young man, Jim Hawkins, for whom uh, this part of the story is he's the narrator. Uh, 15 year old year old um, he comes across some pirates and uh, one of whom is staying at his inn that he and his mother and his late father uh, were all owned and and worked at and uh, they have found that uh, several very vicious pirates have come to take it back upon the death of the owner and they decide to, to run away, the mother and the son run away, and they are able to find help in the local constabulary, and um, the pirates all run off, except for one who is run over by a horse and killed. Um, but it's okay. They compare him. him they compare him being uh, run over by the horse as the same as killing a cockroach. So. So we are, we are not meant to lose much sleep or worry too much about the fate of this particular pirate. Um, so they decide, they open up this package that they find, and they find it has a, a book in it, which is basically uh, an accounting of treasures that have been uh, set aside for this fellow, and, and it's got... Uh, a map written in it with little X's where, presumably, where this treasure is being buried, and a latitude and longitude of the island that it, uh, where the this treasure is supposed to be. And uh, Jim Hawkins uh, goes with his friend, Dr. Livesey, who is a magistrate also, uh, generally seems to be a stand-up guy, and Dr. Livesey, in turn, tells the uh tells squire trelawney who is the apparently the rich fellow in this this part of uh this part of town and the three of them then decide that they are going to um get a ship get a crew they're going to sail to this island and see what there is to see if all these pirates are looking for this book and this map then it's got to be worth something so so that that's what they've done. And so Squire Trelawney has gone to London to purchase a ship with the uh, admonition that he keep all of this information to himself because Squire Trelawney is known to be kind of a blabbermouth and, and kind of talk a lot. And um, so they want him to, they want to remind him, by the way, just keep this to yourself. We don't want everyone knowing about this. And... He goes up to London and he buys a ship called the Hispaniola. And he, in his, and of course, you know, the, the, the thought here, we, we don't see it, but the, the speculation is that he has, in fact, been blabbing about this treasure and about how he needs a ship to go get this treasure. And during the course of his stay in London, he meets a, an, an innkeeper, uh, by the name of John Silver, and he has one leg, and he uh, walks around with a, a crutch under one, uh, under one under one arm, and they once he that the ship and uh, and John Silver helps them uh, find the rest of the crew, so he's going to be the cook on the Hispaniola because he runs an inn, uh, and so. Uh, they're gonna. He's gonna be the cook. He has brought in a whole bunch of other sailors that he knows of, and uh, they are going to be the crew for the Hispaniola on this trip. And they brought in a Mr. Arrow as well um, as a, a, a another another sort of notable uh, character who'll be coming on board. And um, they're getting ready to to set sail. And the now. Squire Trelawney has already been in London for a week or so, and now 
Dr. Livesey and Jim Hawkins are going to go up to London to join him, and the three of them will then uh, go on board the Hispaniola and begin their voyage. So, um, I think that catches you up to date. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I need to mention, but um, why don't we why don't we begin? And if you are ready, we're going to start chapter nine entitled "Powder and Arms." The Hispaniola lay some way out, and we went out. Uh, we went under the figureheads and round the sterns of many other ships and their cables sometimes grated underneath our keel and sometimes swung above us. At last, however, we got alongside and were met and saluted as we stepped aboard by the mate, Mr. Arrow, a brown old soldier with earrings in his ears and a squint. He and the squire were very thick and friendly, but I soon observed things were not the same between Mr. Trelawney and the captain. This last was a sharp-looking man who seemed angry with everything on board and was soon to tell us why, for we had hardly got down into the, cap into the cabin when a sailor followed us. Captain Smollett, sir, axing to speak with you, said he. The cap uh, I am always at the captain's orders. Show him in said the squire. The captain, who was close behind his messenger, entered at once and shut the door behind him. Well, Captain Smollett, what have you to say? All well, I hope, all ship-shape and seaworthy? Well, sir, said the captain, better speak plain. I believe even at the risk of offence. I don't like this cruise, I don't like the men, and I don't like my officer. That's short and sweet. Perhaps, sir, you don't like the ship, inqu inquired the squire, very angry, as I could see. I can't speak to that, sir, not having seen her tried, said the captain. But she seems a clever craft, more I can't say. Possibly, sir, you do not like your employer either, says the squire. But here Dr. Livesey cut in. "'Stay a bit,' said he, "'stay a bit. "'No use of such questions as that but to produce ill feeling. "'The captain has said too much, or he has said too little, "'and I'm bound to say that I require an explanation of his words. "'You don't, you say, like this cruise. "'Now, why?' "'I was engaged, sir, on what, uh, what we call sealed orders, "'to sail this ship for that gentleman where he should bid me said the captain. So far, so good. But now I find that every man before the mast knows more than I do. I don't call that fair, now do you? No, said Dr. Livesey, I don't. Next, said the captain, I learn we're going after treasure. Hear it from my own hands, mind you. Now, treasure is ticklish work. I don't like treasure voyages on any account, and I don't like them above all when they are secret. And when, begging your pardon, Mr. Trelawney, the secret has been told to the parrot. Silver's parrot, asked the squire. In a way of speaking, said the captain, blabbed, I mean. It's my belief neither of you gentlemen know what you are about, but I'll tell you my way of it, life or death, and a close run. That is all clear, and, I dare say, true enough, replied Dr. Livesey. We take the risk, but we are not so ignorant as you believe. Next, you say you don't like the crew. Are you not, uh, are they not good seamen? I don't like them, sir, returned Captain Smollett. And I think I should have had, choosing, had the choosing of my own hands if you go to that. Well, perhaps you should, replied the doctor. My friend should, perhaps, have taken you along with him, but the slight, if there be one, was unintentional. And you don't like Mr. Arrow? I don't, sir. I believe he's a good seaman, but he's too free with the crew to be a good officer. A mate should keep himself to himself, shouldn't drink with the men before the mast. 
Do you mean he drinks? cried the squire. No, sir, replied the captain, only that he's too familiar. Well, now, and the short and long of it, captain, asked the doctor, tell us what you want. Well, gentlemen, are you determined to go on this cruise? Like iron, answered the squire. Very good, said the captain. Then, as you heard me patiently saying things that I could not prove, hear me say a few words more. They are putting the powder and the arms in the forehold. Now, you have a good place under the cabin. Why not put them there? First point. Then you are bringing four of your own people with you, and they tell me some of them are to be berthed forward. Why not give them the berths here beside the captain, besides the cabin? Uh, second point. Any more? asked Mr. Trelawney. One more, said the captain. There's been too much blabbing already. Uh, far too much, agreed the doctor. I'll tell you what I've heard myself, continued Captain Smollett, that you have a map of an island, that there's crosses on the map to show where treasure is, and that the island lies and then he named the latitude and longitude exactly. "'I never told that,' cried the squire, "'to a soul.' "'The hands know it, sir,' replied the cap returned the captain. "'Livesey, that must have been you, or Hawkins,' cried the squire. "'It doesn't much matter who it was,' replied the doctor." and I could see that neither he nor the captain paid much regard to Mr. Trelawney's protestations. Neither did I, to be sure. He was so loose a talker, yet in this case I believe he was really right, and that nobody had told the situation of the island. "'Well, gentlemen,' continued the captain, "'I don't know who has this map, but I make it a point it shall be kept secret even from me and Mr. Arrow.' Otherwise, I would ask you to let me resign. I see, said the doctor. You wish us to keep this matter dark and to make a garrison of the stern part of the ship manned with my friend's own people and provided with all the arms and powder on board. In other words, you fear a mutiny. Sir, said Captain Smollett, with no intention to take offense, I deny your right to put words into my mouth. No, Captain, sir. Uh, no, Captain, sir, would be justified in going to sea at all if he had ground enough to say that. As for Mr. Arrow, I believe him thoroughly honest. Some of the men are the same, all may be for what I know. But I'm responsible for the ship's safety and the life of every man jack aboard her. I see things going, as I think, not quite right and I ask you to take certain precautions, or let me resign my berth, and that's all. Captain Smollett, began the doctor with a smile, did you ever hear the fable of the mountain and the mouse? You'll excuse me, I dare say you remind me of that fable. When you came in here to, I'd stake my wig that you meant more than this. Doctor? said the captain. You're smart. When I came in here, I meant to get discharged. I had no thought that Mr. Trelawney would hear a word. No more I would, cried the squire. Had Livesey been, not been here, I should have seen you to the deuce. As it is, I have heard you, I will do as you desire, and I think the worse of you. That's as you please, sir, said the captain. You'll find I do my duty. And with that, he took his leave. Now, I'm going to deviate from the reading just a moment to go back and reference what they said about the mountain and the mouse. Now, I had to look this up. Maybe you already know this, but I didn't, so I looked it up. Remember, I look it up so you don't have to. Uh, what this is, it's a reference to one of Aesop's fables. Uh, an author is listed as Phaedrus. And uh, this was apparently a story called uh, The Mountain in Labor. 
And what this means is that the mountain, this giant mountain, was rumbling, was thundering, was shaking, was making noise that everyone in 50 miles could hear this noise. The mountain's in labor, right? Going to give birth, possibly. And it's rumbling and it's making all this noise and everyone's in anticipation. They're looking up and they can hear it and they can see it and they, everything's going on. And, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? This is such a big thing. And there's so much noise. There's so much going on. Oh my God. And when it gives birth, it gives birth to a tiny little mouse. So what he's referring to here, the mountain and the mouse, it is a metaphor for something that is a lot of, let's use pull out our Shakespeare for a moment, a lot of sound and fury signifying nothing. It is a lot of noise. It is a lot of buildup and very little payoff. So what they're saying here is that all the captain's protestations about the crew, they feel is for nothing. Okay, moving on. Trelawney, said the doctor, contrary to all my notions, I believe you have managed to get two honest men on board with you, that man and John Silver. Silver, if you like, cried the squire, but... As for that intolerable humbug, I declare I think his conduct unmanly, unsailorly, and downright un-English. Well, said the doctor, we shall see. When we came on deck, the men had begun already to take out the arms and powder, yo-hoing at their work, while the captain and Mr. Arrow stood by superintending. The new arrangement was quite to my liking. The whole schooner had been overhauled. Six berths had been made astern out of what had been the after part of the main hold, and this set of cabins was only joined to the galley and uh, forecastle by a uh, sparred passage on the port side. It had been originally meant that the captain, Mr. Arrow, Hunter, Joyce, the doctor, and the squire were to occupy these six berths. Now Redruth and I uh, were to get two of them, and Mr. Arrow and the captain were to sleep on deck in the companion, which had been enlarged on each side till you might almost have called it a roundhouse. Very low it was still, of course, but there was room to swing two hammocks, and even the mate seemed pleased with the arrangement. Even he, perhaps, had been doubtful as to the crew, but that is only guess, for, as you shall hear, we had not long the benefit of his opinion. We were all hard at work, changing the powder to and the berths, when the last man or two, and Long John along with them, came off a shore boat. The cook came up the side like a monkey for cleverness, and as soon as he saw what was doing, So ho, mates, said he. What's this? We're a changing of the powder, Jack, answers one. Why, by the powers, cried Long John, if we do, then we'll miss the morning tide. My orders, said the captain, shortly. You may go below, my man. Hands will want supper. Aye, aye, sir, answered the cook, and, touching his forelock, he disappeared at once in the direction of his galley. "'That's a good man, Captain,' said the doctor. "'Very likely, sir,' replied Captain Smollett. "'Easy with that man, easy!' He ran on to the fellows who were shifting the powder, and then suddenly observed me examining the swivel gun we carried amidships, a long brass nine. "'Here, you, ship's boy,' he cried. Out of that, off with you to the cook and, and get some work. And then I was scurrying off. I And then as I was scurrying off, I heard him say quite loudly to the doctor, I'll have no favorites on my ship. I assure you that I was uh, quite of the squire's way of thinking and hated the captain deeply. Chapter 10. The Voyage. All that night we were in a great bustle getting things stowed in their place and boatfuls of the squire's friends, Mr. Blandley and the like, coming off to wish him a good voyage and a safe return. 
We never had a night at the Admiral Benbow when I had half the work, and I was dog-tired when, a little before dawn, the boatswain sounded his pipe, and the crew began to man the uh, capstan bars. I might have been twice as weary, yet I would not have left the deck. All was so new and interesting to me. The brief commands, the shrill note of the whistle, the men bustling to their places in the glimmer of the ship's lanterns. "'Now, barbecue, tip us a stave!' cried one voice. "'The old one!' cried another. "'Aye, aye, mates!' said Long John, who was standing by with his crutch under his arm, and at once broke out in the air and words I knew so well. Fifteen men on the dead men's chest. And then the whole crew bore the chorus, Yo-ho-ho and a bottle of rum. And at the third ho, drove the bars before them with a will. Even at that exciting moment, it carried me back to the old Admiral Benbow in a second, and I seemed to hear the voice of the captain piping in the chorus. But soon... The anchor was short up. Soon it was hanging, dripping at bows. Soon the sails began to draw on the land and the shipping uh, and shipping to about to flit by on either side. And before I could lie down to snatch an hour of slumber, the Hispaniola had begun her voyage to the Isle of Treasure. I'm not going to relate that voyage in detail. It was fairly prosperous. The ship proved to be a good ship, the crew were capable seamen, and the captain thoroughly understood his business, but before we came the length of Treasure Island, two or three things had happened which require to be known. Mr. Arrow, first of all, turned out even worse than the captain had feared. He had no command among the men, and people did what they pleased with him. But that was by no means the worst of it, for after a day or two at sea, he began to appear on deck with a hazy eye, red cheeks, stuttering tongue, and other marks of drunkenness. Time after time he was ordered below in disgrace. Sometimes he fell and cut himself. Sometimes he lay all day long in his little bunk at one side of the companion. Sometimes, for a day or two, he would be almost sober and attend to his work, at least passably. In the meantime, we could never make out where he got the drink. What was the ship's mystery? Uh, that was the ship's mystery. Watch him as we pleased, we could do nothing to solve it, and when we asked him to his face, he would only laugh. If he were drunk, and if he were sober, deny solemnly that he ever tasted anything but water. He was not only useless as an officer, and a bad influence among the men, but it was plain that at this rate he must soon kill himself outright, so nobody was much surprised, nor very sorry, when one dark night, with a head sea, he disappeared entirely and was seen no more. Overboard, said the captain. Well, gentlemen, that saves the trouble of putting him in irons. But there we were, without a mate, and it was necessary, of course, to advance one of the men. The boatswain, Jove Anderson, was the likeliest man uh, aboard, and though he kept his old title, he served, in a way, as mate. Mr. Trelawney had followed the sea, and his knowledge made him very useful, for he often took a watch himself in easy weather. The coxswain, Israel Hands, was uh, a careful, wily, old, experienced seaman, who could be trusted in a pinch with almost anything. He was a great confidant of Long John Silver, and so the mention of his name leads me on to speak of our ship's cook, Barbecue, as the men called him. Aboard the ship, he carried his crutch by a lanyard round his neck to have both hands free as possible. It was something to see him wedge the foot of the crutch against a bulkhead 
and propped against it, yielding to every movement of the ship, get on with his cooking like some safe ashore, like someone safe ashore. Still, more strange was it to see him in the heaviest of weather cross the deck. He had a line or two rigged up to help him cross the widest spaces. Long John's earrings, they were called, and he would hand himself from one place to another, now using his crutch, now trailing it alongside by the lanyard, and as quickly as another man could walk. Yet some of the men who had sailed with him before expressed their pity to see him so reduced. "'He's no common man, Barbecue,' said the coxswain to me. "'He had good schooling in his youth days, in his young days, "'and can speak like a book when so minded, and brave. "'A lion's nothing alongside of Long John. "'I've seen him grapple four and knock their heads together, him unarmed.' "'All the crew respected and even obeyed him.' He had a way of talking to each and doing everybody some particular service. To me, he was always unweariedly kind, and always glad to see me in the galley, which he kept as clean as a new pin. The dishes hanging up, burnished, and his parrot in a cage in one corner. "'Come away, Hawkins,' he would say. "'Come and have a yarn with John. Nobody more welcome than yourself, my son.' Sit you down and hear the news. Here's Captain Flint. I calls my parrot Captain Flint, after the famous buccaneer. Here's Captain Flint, predicting success to our voyage. Was it you, Captain? And the parrot would say with great rapidity, Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! Till you wondered that it was not out of breath, or till John threw his handkerchief over the cage. Now that bird, he would say, is maybe two hundred years old, Hawkins. They lives forever, mostly, and if anybody's seen more wickedness, it must be the devil himself. She's sailed with England, the great Captain England, the pirate, she's been at Madagascar and at Malabar, the Suriname, and Providence and Portobello. She was at the, the fishing up of the wrecked plate ships. It's there she learned pieces of eight, and little wonder, 350,000 of them, Hawkins. She was at, a, at the boarding of the Viceroy of the Indies, out at Goa, she was, and to look at you, and to look at her, you would think she was a baby. But you smelt powder, didn't you, Captain? Stand by to go about! the parrot would scream. Ah, she's a handsome craft, she is, the cap, the cook would say, and give her sugar from his pocket. And then the bird would peck at the bars and swear straight on, passing belief for, wicked, for wickedness. There, John would add, you can't touch pitch without uh, and not be mucked, lad. Here's this Poor old innocent bird of mine, swearing blue fire, and none the wiser you may lay to that. She would swear the same in a matter of speaking before chaplain. And John would touch his forelock with a, a solemn way he had that made me think he was the best of men. In the meantime, Squire and Captain Smollett were still on pretty distant terms with one another, the squire made no bones about the matter. He despised the captain. The captain, on his part, never spoke but when he was spoken to, and then sharp and short and dry, and not a word wasted. He owned, when driven into a corner, that he seemed to have been wrong about the crew, that some of them were as brisk as he wanted to see, and all had behaved fairly well. As for the ship, he had taken a downright fancy to her. She'll lie a point nearer the wind than a man has a right to expect of his own married wife, sir. But, he would add, all I say is, we're not home again and I don't like the cruise. 
The squire, at this, would turn away and march up and down the deck, chin in air. A trifle more of that man, he would say, and I should explode. We had some heavy weather, which only proved the qualities of the Hispaniola. Every man on board seemed well content, and they must have been hard to please if they had been otherwise, for it is my belief there was never a ship's company so spoiled since Noah put to sea. Double grog was going on the least excuse. There was duff on odd days, as, for instance, if the squire heard it was any man's birthday, and always a barrel of apples standing broached in, in the waist for anyone to help himself that had a fancy. Never knew good come of it yet, the captain said to Dr. Livesey. Spoil forecastle hands, make devils, that's my belief. But good did come of the apple barrel, as you shall hear, for if it had not been for that, we should have had no note of warning and might all have perished by the hand of treachery. This was how it came about. We had run up the trades to get the wind of the island we were after. I am not allowed to be more plain. And now we were running down, running down for it with a bright lookout day and night. It was about the last day of our, uh, of our outward voyage, by the largest computation some time that night, or, at latest, before noon of the morrow, we should sight the treasure island. We were heading south-southwest, and had a steady breeze abeam and a quiet sea. The Hispaniola rolled steadily, dipping her bowsprit now and, th and then with a whiff of spray. All was drawing alow and aloft. Everyone in, uh, was in the bravest spirits, because we were now so near an end of the first part of our adventure. Now, just after sundown, when all my work was over and I was on my way to my berth, it occurred to me that I should like an apple. I ran on deck. The watch was all forward, looking out for the island. The man at the helm was watching the luff of the sail, and whistling away gently to himself, and that was the only sound excepting the swish of the sea against the, bow, the, the bows and around the sides of the ship. In I got bodily into the apple barrel and found there was scarce an apple left. But, sitting down there in the dark, what with the sound of the waters and the rocking movement of the ship, I had either fallen asleep or was on the point of doing so, when a heavy man sat down with rather a clash close by. The barrel shook as he leaned his shoulders against it, and I was just about to jump up when the man began to speak. It was Silver's voice, and before I had heard a dozen words, I would not have shown myself for all the world, but lay there, trembling and listening, in, ex in the extreme of fear and curiosity, for from these dozen words I understood that the lives of all the honest men aboard depended upon me alone. And now, just a moment here. Chapter 11. What I Heard in the Apple Barrel No, not I, said Silver. Flint was captain. I was quartermaster along of along of my timber leg. The same broadside I lost my leg, old Pew lost his deadlights. It was a master surgeon him that uh, amputated me out of college and all, Latin by the bucket and what not, but he was hanged like a dog and sun dried like the rest at Corso Castle. That was Robert's men that was, and come of changing names of their ships, royal fortune, and so on. Now what a ship was christened, so let her stay, I says. So it was with the Cassandra, as brought us all safe home from Malabar, after England took the Viceroy of the Indies. So it was with the old walrus, 
flints, old ship, as I've seen a muck with the red blood and fit to sink with gold. Ah, cried another voice, that of the youngest hand on board and evidently full of admiration. He was the flower of the flock, was Flint. Davis was a man, too, by all accounts, said Silver. I never sailed along of him, first with England, then with Flint. That's my story. And now, here on my own account, in a manner of speaking, I laid by nine hundred safe. From England and two thousand after Flint. That ain't bad for a man before the mast, all safe in bank. Taint earning now. It's saving, does it? You may lay to that. Where's all England's men now? I dunno. Where's Flint's? Why, most of them aboard here, and glad to get the duff. Been begging before that. Some of them, old Pew, as had lost his sight and might have thought shame, spends twelve hundred pounds a year like a lord in Parliament. Where is he now? Well, he's dead now and under hatches. But for two year before that, shiver me timbers, the man was starving. He begged and he stole and he cut throats and starved at that by the powers. Well, it ain't much use after that, said the young seaman. Tain't much use for fools, you may lay to it, that nor nothing, cried Silver. But now you look here. You're young, you are, but you're as smart as paint. I see that when I set my eyes on you, and I'll take you like a man. I'll talk to you like a man. You may imagine how I felt when I heard this abominable old rogue addressing another in the very same words of flattery as he had used to myself. I think if I had been able, that I would have killed him through the barrel. Meantime... He ran on, little supposing he was overheard. Here it is about gentlemen of fortune. They lives rough, and they risk swinging. But they eat and drink like fighting cocks, and when a cruise is done, why, it's hundreds of pounds instead of hundreds of farthings in their pockets. Now, the most goes for rum and a good fling, but to see again in their and to see again in their shirts. But that's not the course I lay. I puts it all the way, some here, some there, and none too much anywheres by reason of suspicion. I'm fifty, mark you. Once back from this cruise, I set up gentlemen in earnest. Time enough, too, says you. Ah, but I've lived easy in the meantime. Never denied myself a nothing heart's desires, and slept soft and ate dainty all my days, but when at sea. And how did I begin? Before the mast, like you. Well, said the other, but all the other money's gone now, ain't it? You daren't show face in Bristol after this. Why... "'Where might you suppose it was?' asked Silver, derisively. "'At Bristol, in banks and places,' answered his companion. "'It were,' said the cook, "'it were when we weighed anchor. "'But my old missus has it all by now, "'and the spyglass is sold, lease and goodwill and rigging, "'and the old girl's off to meet me. "'I would tell you where, for I trust you, but uh, it'd make you uh, jealousy among the mates. And can you trust your missus? asked the other. Gentlemen of fortune, returned the cook, usually trust little among themselves, and right they are. You may lay to it. But I have a way with me. I have. When a mate brings a slip on his cable, one as knows me, I mean, it won't be in the same world with old John. There was some that was feared of Pew, and some that was feared of Flint. But Flint was his own self, was feared of me. Feared he was, 
and proud. They was the roughest crew afloat, was Flint's. The devil himself could have been feared to go to sea with them. Well, now, I tell you, I'm not a boasting man, but you seen yourself how easy I keep company. But when I was quartermaster, lambs wasn't the word for Flint's old buccaneers. Ah, you may be sure of yourself in old John's ship. Well, I tell you now, replied the lad, I didn't have half a quarter like the job till I had this talk with you, John, but there's my hand on it now. And a brave lad you were, and smart too, answered Silver, shaking hands so heartily that all the barrels shook. And a finer figurehead for a gentleman of fortune I never clapped my eyes on. By this time I had begun to understand the meaning of their terms, by a gentleman of fortune, they plainly meant neither more nor less than a common pirate, and the little scene I had overheard was the last act in the corruption of one of the honest hands, perhaps of the last one left on board. But on this point I was soon to be relieved, for Silver giving a little whistle, a third man strolled up and sat down by the party. "'Dick's square,' said Silver. "'Oh, I know Dick was square,' returned the voice of the, of the, cock, uh, the coxswain. "'Israel hands.' "'He's no fool, is Dick?' And he turned his quid and spat. "'But look here,' he went on. "'Here's what I want to know, Barbecue.' How long are we a-going to stand off and on like a blessed bumboat? I've had a most enough, uh, Captain Smollett. He's hazing me long enough by thunder. I want to go into that cabin, I do. I want their pickles and wines and that. Israel, said Silver, your head ain't much account, nor ever was. But you're able to hear, I reckon, leastways your ears is big enough. Now here's what I say. You'll berth forward, and you'll live hard, and you'll speak soft, and you'll keep sober till I give the word, and you may lay to that, old son. Well, I don't say no, do I? growled the, the coxswain. That I, uh, what I say is when. That's what I say. When, by the powers cried Silver. Well, now, if you want to know, I'll tell you when. The last moment I can manage, and that's when. Here's a first-rate seaman, Captain Smollett, sails the blessed ship for us. Here's the squire and doctor with a map and such. I don't know where it is, do I? No more than you do, says you. Well, then, I mean this squire and doctor shall find the stuff and help us to get it aboard by the powers. Then we'll see. If I was sure of you all, sons of double Dutchmen, I'd have Captain Smollett navigate us halfway back again before I struck. Why, we're all seamen aboard here, I should think, said the lad Dick. We're all forecastle hands, you mean, snapped Silver. We can steer a course, but who's to set one? That's what all you gentlemen split on, first and last. If I had my way, I'd have Captain Smollett work us back into the trades at least. Then we'd have no blessed miscalculations and a spoonful of water a day. But I know the sort you are. I'll finish with them at the island as soon as the blunt's on board. And a pity it is. But you're never happy till you're drunk. Split my sides. I've a sick heart to sail with the likes of you. Easy all long, John, cried Israel. Who's crossing of you? Who's a crossing of you? Why, how many tall ships, think ye, now have I seen laid aboard? And how many brisk lads drying in the sun at execution dock? cried Silver. And all for this same hurry and hurry and hurry. 
you hear me? I seen a thing or two at sea, I have. If you would only lay your course and a pint to windward, you would ride in carriages, you would. But not you. I know you. You'll have uh, your mouthful of rum tomorrow and go hang. Everybody knowed you was a kind of a chapling, John, but there's others as good hand and steer as well as you, said Israel. They liked a bit of fun, they did. They wasn't so high and dry, no how, but took their fling like jolly companions, every one. So, says Silver, well, and where are they now? Pew was that sort, and he died a beggar man. Flint was, and he died of rum at Savannah. Ah, they were a sweet crew, they was. Only, where are they? But, asked Dick, when we do lay em athwart, what are we to do with em anyhow? There's the man for me, cried the cook ad admiringly. That's what I call business. Well, what do you think? Put him ashore like maroons? That would have been England's way, or cut him down like that much pork. That would have been Flint's or Billy Bones. Yeah, Billy was the man for that, said Israel. Dead men don't bite, says he. Well, he's dead now, hisself. He knows the long and short of it now, and if ever a rough hand come to port, it was Billy. Right you are, said Silver. Rough and ready, but mark you here, I'm an easy man. I'm quite the gentleman, says you, but this time it's serious. Duty is duty, mates. I give my vote. Death. When I'm in Parliament and riding in my coach, I don't want none of these sea lawyers in the cabin of coming home unlooked for like the devil at prayers. Wait is what I say, but when the time comes, why let her rip? John, cries the coxswain, you're a man. You'll say so, Israel, when, you'll, when you see said Silver. Only one thing I claim. I claim Trelawney. I'll wring his calf's head off his body with these hands. Dick, he added, breaking off, you just jump up like a sweet lad and get me an apple to wet my pipes like. You may fancy the terror I was in. I should have leapt out and run for it if I had found the strength, but my limbs and heart alike misgive me. I heard Dick begin to rise, then someone seemingly stopped him, and a voice of and the voice of hands exclaimed, Oh stow that Don't you get suckin' off that bilge, John? Let's go let's have a go of the rum. Dick, said Silver, I trust you. I've a gauge on the keg, mind. There's the key. You fill up pannikin and bring it up. Terrified as I was, I could not help thinking to myself that this must have been how Mr. Arrow got the strong waters that destroyed him. Dick was gone but a little while, and uh, was gone but a little while, and during his absence, Israel spoke straight on in the cook's ear. It was but a word or two that I could catch, and yet I gathered some important news, for besides other scraps that tended to the same purpose, this whole clause was audible. Not another man of them'll jine. Hence, there were still faithful men on board. When Dick returned, uh, one after another of the trio took the pannikin and drank. One, to luck. Another, here's to old Flint and Silver himself, saying in a kind of song, Here's to ourselves, and hold your luff, plenty of prizes and plenty of duff. Just then, a sort of brightness fell upon me in the barrel, and looking up, I found the moon had risen. 
and I was silvering the mizzen top, uh, and was silvering the mizzen top and shining white on the luff of the foresail. And almost at the same time, the voice of the lookout shouted, "Land ho!" And that, my friends, is the end of chapter eleven, where. Apparently, we have reached the island. But what happens? Well, we'll have to wait. Um, thank you very much for joining me today for another three chapters of Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. I hope you all have a very good weekend. We will be back on Monday at 4 p.m. as we read the next three chapters, 12, 13, and 14, and we will find out what happens on Treasure Island. Thank you very much for joining me. We'll see you again. Bye, everyone.